If you ever do, if you ever transcribe Philippians 1 and 2, everything's not going to be in perfect order <laughs> because, number one, I've got to start over on some things and reintroduce some things. Number two, that's just the way it works when you're dealing with me, which is part of your training into the nature of Christ. <laughs> God is so good to y'all. <laughs> He sent you me. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> um, well, I want to begin with a <clears throat> my usual disclaimer. Uh, anything that I say, don't try this at home. <clears throat> uh, this doesn't, how shall I say this, this doesn't apply to you. This don't, you know, get all freaked out. In fact, I'll even say it a little bit differently. I... Uh, <clears throat> What I want to do is I want to talk to you about uh, a certain reality. I've shared on it before in the first part. Uh, a certain reality of something. And in this, in this book and in these chapters of Philippians, it is setting forth something that what I want you to do is... I. I don't want you to try to figure it out at this point and try to work it into your lives. I just want you to see for yourself if this is if what I'm saying is right according to the scriptures, which you know this this I say this for every course, but nonetheless to 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 find it out for yourself if it's true or to find out by comparing and listening and see if, you know, if I'm on course with this. <clears throat> um, after so many years, people seem to think that I have an agenda, maybe even particularly on the cross and maybe even particularly relating to Christ and Him crucified. But I'm going to tell you, and you won't believe this, but I don't have an agenda. The Holy Spirit does. <laughs> and he, keeps, he won't let me up. I mean, I cannot open my Bible and not see this. I've tried. I have literally read, I have looked for some of the most carnal books I could find. But usually, usually they'll put a scripture in there, and that'll do it, right? Because <laughs> this gets in the scripture. So, so I, I'm telling you, I really am not, you know, going, well, this is my thing. It's not, I, if, honestly, folks, I'll just tell you straight out. If, it, if I, there was a thing that was Randy's thing, I wouldn't choose the cross, okay? <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe the prosperity gospel or something. You know, you know something, something a lot more fun and benefits. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit has got something else in mind, so I, you know, I'm going to stick with him because I know that's the best way to go in this thing. All right, Philippians, let's start. Um, <clears throat> we really did a good job in the first go around of this of covering chapter one. I didn't feel like I covered everything in chapter two and I felt like we were getting behind so I rushed through parts of it. But the only way to really get into this is to just start at chapter two and relook at some things here. And I'm sure I could read this without these but I'm just gonna try. All right, if, verse one, <clears throat> if there be Therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any, any tender mercies and compassions, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. <clears throat> Notice the words in verse 2, like-minded, same, one accord, one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. <clears throat> you could call vainglory, another word might be pride. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others. Oh, that sentence went on. <laughs> that wasn't the end of it. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And now, beginning with verse 5, he begins to show us the 
the premise for what, what he's saying this, the reason and the absolute conviction that he has. He's, he's another one of these guys that appears he has a, an agenda of the cross. <laughs> and he, so he starts and he says, now, you know, he, he, he gets off of the subject of the people and the moment and the incidents is happening. And he points them here to the cross. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, some of your translations are going to translate that as attitude instead of mind or nature because it's not the regular word for mind. It's not saying it's a mental thing. It's not saying that it's a, a, a knowledge but it's an attitude or a nature. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And by the way, you should check that out. Get a Strong's Concordance or something else and make sure that I'm not twisting the scriptures. Make sure that it says that the true meaning is what I just said. And if it isn't, then you owe it to yourself and to the Lord to only believe the word of God. <clears throat> All right. Who, who being, speaking of Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And the word robbery there really is in the margin of some of your Bibles, it'll say, thought it not a thing to be grasped after or that sort of thing, <clears throat> to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and that is actually to empty himself, and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. All right. <clears throat> it's important that we realize the context of these scriptures. So much of Christianity just pulls a verse out and uses it the way it sounds all by itself. And we need to always, always read the verses in front and behind. In fact, probably tonight in the, these two classes, we will see many, many examples of that where people have pulled things out and you know, really just made it say something that it doesn't say. <clears throat> um, first of all, there's a difference between doctrine and truth. Okay. Now, if you're a, if you're a Christian, if you're a, a child of God, then you don't want just doctrine. You want the truth of God. <laughs> you know, you don't want to just be taught stuff. Anybody can teach you stuff. You know, almost any course, whether it's religious or secular or whatever, you have different teachers, and they're all going to teach it a different way, you know. But God, you, if you know the truth, you will see the truth throughout the Word. And the Holy Spirit will teach you that, and he will open your eyes. But if you ever settle back into being satisfied with just teaching doctrine doctrine the, another word for doctrine is just teaching if you ever settle back in for that <clears throat> and you've lost your edge <laughs> you've lost the eye of the tiger <laughs> you've fallen into uh, religion because you're not a seeker of truth anymore my my lord I just want to be a seeker of truth I want to be a seeker of the Lord I want to know the Lord in truth I don't want to know the religious view of him. <clears throat> and um, in these scriptures, Paul is not really teaching. That's not what he's really trying to do. It's a letter, and it's a letter to a church, and it's a letter to a church that's having problems. And did anybody notice the problems as we read from verse 1 up to this point? See, he's not teaching doctrine. He's talking to them about the issues, and what he's doing is he's telling them the truth. <laughs> he's telling them the truth. He's, you know, we're so into all of this stuff. It's, but this is not theological teaching. This book, this chapter is not theological teaching. But it's, it's Christ 
because didn't you notice, let this mind be in you, and he's talking about Jesus, but then he's talking about the mind of Jesus that took him to the cross. He's saying, uh, he's, he's teaching them God's reality. He's not teaching theo theologically. He's not trying to do that. And, and, uh, and in fact, he's teaching Christ as applied practically or in a practical way in our life. Well, personally, as a pastor, I think that's one of the big things that's lacking in the church today is that there's, you know, so much just deep or far out great teaching on all these subjects, but nothing's really changing anybody, you know, and it makes people feel spiritual when they're not. You know, and the proof of that is what they do when they get outside the church. Or even in the church. All the you know, this church at Philippi is no different than anybody else's group. They have divisions, they're griping, they're fighting one among one another, they're having uh, uh, things going on between them and they can't get over it and they can't forgive and they can't, you know, they can't um, live Christ because somebody just told them all of the spiritual truth is true theologically. Well, theologically, you're in Christ. Well, theolo and you are, but, but you need to know that you're in Christ more than theologically. It needs to be an anchor to your soul, and that's what Hebrews talks about when it's talking about being in Christ. An anchor to your soul that, 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 that is on the surface, bouncing around off of surface things, but there's a an anchor that goes down deep, you know, and it holds you in place, and it's that reality of being anchored in Christ. But, but the way, either the way it's taught or the way that we receive it is, well, then I'm in Christ and everything's wonderful and I'm spiritual. No, you know, just, just watch yourself for about a week. Most of you, it only take a day, but nonetheless. <clears throat> so, um, so what we're finding, and this is one of the, the points I want you to consider about Philippians, not about this class, not about me, not about what I'm teaching, but is this discussing a, like a, a, a theological dispute that has happened in this church? And the answer is, just, just read it. One through four will lead you right up to it. No, it's not a theological dispute. It's problems among people. It's people putting themselves in front of other people. It's people fighting to be first instead of laying down their life and letting others go. It, it is, it is a, 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 a self-centric mindset, which is not the mind of Christ. And self-centric is not necessarily selfish as what we understand. And I explain this a lot, not a lot, but I have many times, because when you say selfish, most people immediately go, well, no, I'm not, you know, I mean, we, that's one reason why people like watching reality TV. Because you, you see blatant examples of really selfish people. Anybody agree with that? <laughs> you know, I mean, just so we go, oh, thank God I'm not like them. But you're still self-centric. In other words, you, you, you make friends based on how that relates to you, how that helps you or blesses you. You stay away from certain people because you, they got nothing to add to me. They're no help or no whatever, you know what I mean? And it's all based on, well, my preference is this and this and this, so I wouldn't like so-and-so, so I'm not even going to try. You know, it's... You know, those are natural traits within all of us unless that's broken by Christ and Him crucified, unless that's broken by this mind, this nature in us. And so, um, you know, you, you see this. Paul sees this problem. And he's a minister. And, and when I say that, that's not, that's not that he's a professional minister. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about he's given his life to bring the people of God into the fullness of God. And he sees these problems. 
and he's looking for an answer. He's looking for, you know, uh, some way that he can bring them into that. <clears throat> and so he sees these arguments. He sees these, um, this unforgiveness that's going on. He sees people putting themselves first, and he sees the, the hurt feelings and the pride and the, all the junk, you know, that's, that's going on with that. But he didn't see that as a violation of Christian doctrine. I mean, stay with the scriptures here. He doesn't see that as a violation of Christian doctrine. He doesn't go, that's not the way that Christians are supposed to act. <laughs> that's not, you know, the Bible says, you know, love one another. He's not, he's not going at this on a Christian doctrine basis. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because while we may sit in the class and hear this stuff and nod and even agree with it, so much of Christianity is just trying to line Christians up with Christian doctrine. Okay, we still haven't got to what it is yet, but it's, it's not a violation of Christian behavior, not, not to Paul. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's not going at this as a Christian religion that you're violating. You say, well, well, even if he's not, it is a violation of Christian behavior. Yeah, but Paul's not trying to fix it by um, behavior modification. He's, he's dealing with it through the cross and through Christ crucified. And, and to Paul, here's the other thing. And this is bigger than I think we're going to realize. That this, to him, is not a problem of fallen mankind. To him, this is a violation of Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you. Let the mind of Christ, let the spirit and nature of Christ be in you. He's dealing with what will fix the thing, and Christian behavior is not what he ordered up. You know, what, what will you have with that? You want fries? You want behavior modification? You want, you know what I mean? Yes, you know, we're church members, and, and give, us a, give us an order of fasting, and give us an order of this and that and that. No, give us the cross. Give us Christ crucified. Give us the reality that Paul gave to the first church, the man that God ordained in that place and in that position. Give us the pure word of God. Give us the pure word of God. But you know, <clears throat> I mean, well, keep your place here. But look over with me uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. And I'll say this before I say my next statement. Ephesians 4 verse 17. Got this right? Yeah. <clears throat> this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. Don't you love that right off the bat? He doesn't say, this is what I say. He says, this I say, and testify in the Lord. For him, it all has to emanate, to flow out from the Lord. It's not just well, I got into the word and I saw this. He's going, you know, and Jesus said that, though. You remember that? Jesus said, my doctrine is not my own. And there has to come a day when it's no longer what you think and what you believe. It's what you are convinced is God's word. And it'll, it'll, <laughs> it will ruffle your feathers. It'll rip in your stare, but it'll do, it will because it's contrary to the natural mind. It's contrary to the basic teachings we all had. But if you want Jesus, the Holy Spirit will confirm that, and he'll bear witness to that, and he'll, he'll show you that. But that's only the beginning stages, folks. The beginning, the early stages is bearing witness. It must go 
into God revealing these things so that it, it, to you and in you so that it's not your doctrine anymore. It's his. And that's what you preach. Verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, not the teaching, the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Now, here's what we'd say. We'd hear all that, or a, a, a normal pastor would say, lasciviousness, all uncleanliness with greediness. Well, you need to repent, or you need to get in line with, with Christian doctrine, and you need to come in line with Christian behavior. But what does the next verse say? But you have not so learned Christ. To him, it's an issue of Christ. It's not an issue of doctrine. It's not an issue of theology. It's not, a, the, you know, I don't think Paul in any way, shape, or form thought he was starting a new religion. I think he was just preaching the fulfillment of what the old covenant was supposed to be about. Jesus, Jesus, the length and the breadth, as he, in his words, the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. And to find Christ the living, the, he says, alienated from the life of God. Well, most Christians know doctrine, don't they? Most Christians know what's right and wrong, but folks, that's the wrong tree, tree of the knowledge of right and wrong, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the tree of life was the one God wanted him to eat of. And he, it's the same thing with us, folks. Knowing right and wrong, doctrine, knowing, okay, well, this is right for what the Lord expects of us, and this is wrong. Folks, what makes that any different than what the Jews had under the Old Covenant? It was just spelled out to them, thou shalt not and thou shalt. But Christ came to live in us and to bring forth glory to God in the church. You ever read that scripture? That Christ may be glorified in the church, not by the church. We're all going, yeah, yeah, and he's going, well, it's great. Thanks for the really cool reception at the worship service, but I'd really rather be glorified in you. Yeah. <laughs> well, th but will this do? Because <laughs> I got some stuff I need to get done out here, and it's not necessarily evil. It's good. And he says, wrong tree, wrong tree. You're eating off the wrong tree. <clears throat> so Paul, Paul goes right at it. I mean, it's here, and that's the thing. As you must do, and many of you have, I had to do, and I had to read this and find him listing bad things after bad things, and before I would get to that next verse, I had to think, what have I been taught? What does the church teach? And it was never, don't do that because that's not how you learn Christ. Christ isn't that way in you. You know? And it, that wasn't my answer. I had some doctrinal thing that would bring about a, a change. And it wasn't Christ. Wasn't Christ alienated from the life of God, but you have not so learned Christ as life. You've learned him as life. Hallelujah. <clears throat> All right. But if you go back to Philippians, <clears throat> in Philippians we notice a a further step from what we just read in Ephesians. Now, the truth is, Ephesians goes on to say what Philippians says, but we stopped at a certain juncture, and I intentionally stopped there because I wanted to make a statement that these disputes and all of the things that were going on there, uh, I said they're not just a violation of Christian doctrine or Christian behavior, and they're not just a problem of fallen mankind, but they are a violation of Jesus Christ 
But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are we, are we reading Philippians 2? Are we genuinely seeing what he's saying? Because you know what? He's not just saying that the answer is Jesus Christ. He's not just saying that it's a violation of Jesus Christ. He's not. There's something. It's like a magnifying glass. It gets, they're hon he's honing in on the full answer. And the full answer is, let this mind be in you, which all who da 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 made himself obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The answer is not just Jesus Christ. It's Christ and him crucified. Look at it. Look at it. See, he didn't, interestingly enough, come on, let's think of this. Think, think, think the way we think. <laughs> and, and examine this scripture in light of that. We would say, you know, you're doing these things wrong and everything, but the answer is Jesus. And if you got a big crowd, you go, the answer is Jesus. And everybody goes, ah. But Paul said, no, the answer is Christ crucified. And you need to let that same mind of Christ crucified work in you. That's the answer. Because this fighting and these divisions and you putting yourself first and them putting themselves first, what is that going to lead to? What is that going to lead to? What's well, going to lead to disputations and problems and unforgiveness and people, you know. So he says, he, do, he doesn't say, now, you know, we just need to look to Jesus here. You know what I mean? I mean, think about it. That's what we would say. Well, let's just look to Jesus as we all lift our head up and we, oh, Lord Jesus, far away. Oh, so, so, so far away. Please just just crumbs from heaven, just drop down a few blessings. Folks, Paul is saying you need Jesus all right, but you need the mind of Christ, you need the attitudes of Christ in you. You don't need to look way up there. You need to look to the cross and you need to look to it at work in you. Can I get an amen? amen? Hey, don't try this at home. Don't worry about it. What we're actually concentrating on right now in all truth is we're concentrating on is this really what he's saying here? And, and not just what I've said so far, but what I will be saying. Is this really the issue? Because we could have said Jesus Christ is the answer on any number of things. Well, Jesus will come here and he'll fix this. And, or Jesus will, you know, uh, um, do a miracle or any number of ways. But Paul, no, the man, if we didn't know his name, the man whom God chose to write the word and protect it for thousands of years points to Christ crucified. And you know what? If that's in the word and that's what he's really saying, then I need to sh not only shut up, I need to shut down. I need to shut down my theology and embrace his. And yet it's not theology, is it? It's not theology. It is embracing the life of God, which is self-giving to the point of the cross, which is basically what he said. Let that, let that be in you. Look at Jesus. He, he, was, he was, you know, uh, God. He was uh, Lord in heaven. He was all of these things. And you know, they, they slapped him and they beat him and they did all this stuff and they lied about him and they accused him. Folks, that, you know, we can see that in a Bible story, but wait till that happens to you. Wait till people start saying stuff about you that's absolutely not true and it violates, the things they say violate anything that you have tried to live for God by Christ. And see if something doesn't start coming up that goes, well, this ain't right. But you, we can sit here and go, well, yeah, they, they slapped Jesus. And that's, and that's not right. See, but Paul, he's going right for the juggler. He's going right to where we live. 
And he's saying, the only thing that's going to make a difference in this church, you Philippians, is Christ crucified, not 2,000 years ago and all the blessings and, you know, Christmas presents around the bottom of the cross. But it's going to be him living in you now, that same selfless spirit that he came and manifested. Amen? <laughs> I was preaching in Belgium just a week ago, and I did my usual thing at this point. You know, I would say, uh, well, you're still glad I came? And I and it kept building until about the third time. I said, well, you're still glad I came? And some of them kind of went, well, I don't know. <laughs> and I laughed. <laughs> you're, you're wise to say that. You're wise to... To go, I don't know, you know, this because it proves that this this stuff is not necessarily fun to us. But if it is God's heart and his word, if it is what he desires, and if it is the way he wants his body to look, his bride to be like him, then what can we do? What can I do but go after it with all my heart? If I'm convinced, if I'm not convinced, then I'm just, ah, ah, Randy teaches that. You know what I mean? And no big deal. I'm not responsible. See, I let you off the hook all the time. Because guess why? You, you say, you shouldn't do that. Well, you'd do it anyway. I mean, you know, or you're, or you're going to go after the Lord. You know what I mean? So I just, that way you're not going to be, you have to stand before God for not doing it because I let you, well, I let you off the hook. And I said, hey, you don't have to do that. But you'll slip up somewhere. <laughs> we want Christ. And we want him not just as our Savior that's now far, far away. And we, and we don't just want him as our, uh, you know, the one that does all these great things out here and all this kind of stuff. I want him by his true nature that he came to show us at Calvary, in me, in me. Notice I didn't say it. In me. I want that. I want that more than anything. I, I do. And I, I have to regularly go against any tendencies that I have. I have to identify them. We, it takes a long time just to get to the point where you can identify that. Oh, my God, that's... I've been doing that for years and calling it spiritual. <laughs> it was nothing but the flesh, you know. And so, but, but don't you know that there takes a, a, a desire, a passion for the Lord that'll, that'll push you towards that. When the heart, heart turns to the Lord, not the head. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Amen. You know, not the head turns to the Lord. When the heart turns and the passion arises in you that says, oh my gosh, this is his word. This is what he believes. This is who he is. This is the way he is. How can I claim I love him when I don't love that? If they're the same thing. Yeah, and then I go, I can't. I can't. I, I, I'm, you know. <laughs> I'm stripped naked before the Lord, and I go, okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I love you. I do love you. But it, it takes a while to, to start working these things in us. That's why I say don't worry about it right now. Why? Because we need to see this for ourselves so that if anybody comes up and says, well, Randy was teaching on da 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 you can say, I don't know what Randy teaches, but right here in the Word of God, it says this. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Amen. <clears throat> All right, I'm not getting very far here. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> some things never change. All right, flip over one page toward the front, Philippians 1 and verse 21. <clears throat> Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, this is, I'm reading from the King James, but I believe that the King James is correct in its wording. There are some translations that may translate this out. Do you have a King James or do you have, a, what version do you have, NIV? Amplified. Amplified, well, you, you should be covered there. <laughs> <laughs> for to me, to myself, <laughs> 
the id, the i, the... <laughs> All right. Well, the wording right here says, for to me to live is Christ. What does is, what is yours say? Let me hear the Amplified. Well, that was good. That was good because it didn't sound like it was good at first because it says, for me to live is Christ, right? Isn't that the first word? But then it said, go on and read the rest again. Well, in um, parentheses, it has his life in me. His life in me, see? There's that acknowledgement because what he's saying is, what he's, the wording is, for to me, my view of this, to live is Christ. He's not saying for me to live. For me to live is death. <laughs> but for, for to me, this is my view, Paul is saying, to live is Christ and to die is gain. All right, bunch, a bunch of stuff there. <clears throat> but what, we're, what we see is that this was a statement he made before he got to chapter 2. He is already plowing the ground. He's trying, to get him to, he's trying to get him to come to a mindset. He hasn't really brought up the problems yet that they're having. He just wants them to agree with truth. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get you to do. I'm not trying to deal with the problems yet. I just want you to agree with truth because if you can agree with truth, then the truth can make you free, not me using the truth. The truth will do it big difference it's a big difference so <clears throat> so that's why keep looking at it keep listening and comparing and thinking about it and and trying to see if that's exactly what it's saying so there's several things that he hits right here <clears throat> um, for to me he says in other words he's not really including anybody else at this point either he will in chapter 2, won't he? But at this stage, he's not. He's just saying, look, this is my view. You don't have to have my view if you don't want it, but da 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 but I still got a couple more chapters left. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, you know, he, he knows what he's doing. But he says, for, you know, this is my opinion. To me, you know, to live is Christ. But see, he doesn't just leave. He doesn't just go, yeah, it's Christ, so anything goes. I can live anyway, but it's Jesus. You know, he's not saying. And then, but he nails it down. He says, he wants you to understand that the Christ he's talking about is in relationship to death and resurrection, not the historical event, but the spiritual reality. And to die is gain. Death is gain. Okay, now, <clears throat> all right. So I know that most of us read that scripture, and 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 we we read that scripture in a certain context and a certain understanding, which is, which is still true, but but it causes us to miss something greater, and that is when he says to die is gain. He's not going. You know, I will tell you what, I can't wait to die. I'm going to get streets of gold and gates of pearl, and I'm going to get me a big old mansion, and, you know, I'm going to have big angels, you know, walking alongside me on streets of gold. It's going to be wonderful. And those gates of pearl, I'm going to, I'm going to dig a couple of them big pearly things out of there and put it in my office, you know. You know, we're, we're just going, you know, the die's getting, folks, that's not what he's talking about. The context of the whole book proves that. Okay, now, is that still true? Yes. Is it also true that, you know, there's no question about it, that he understands that that's true, and that when he physically dies, it's, it's not going to be a bad thing? Can I say it like that? He understands that. We understand that. But we're, but we're trying to open our vision of this a little further and to find out, is that all that he's saying here? Because... The next chapter is going to prove that he's not. He was setting them up. <laughs> he's setting them up for, for the truth as it is in Jesus. All right. And in the third chapter, he really gets it. We'll get into all that. <clears throat> um, all right. So <clears throat> let's go to Colossians chapter 2. 
Colossians 2 and verse 16. All right, we've been talking about this difference between doctrine and, and life. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in foods or in drink or in respect of a feast day or of a, the new moon or of a Sabbath day, which are a shadow, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Christ, the body is Christ. Do you see what that's saying? Anybody see what that's saying? My God, what is that saying? That's an incredible verse. It's, is it just me and Mallory? Ah! <laughs> it's wonderful. It's saying all of the things that were their religious order, what they kept and did was all according to God and perfect. He's saying all that was a shadow, but that's not it. He, just, he, say, he doesn't just say that was a shadow of Christ. He says, which are a shadow of things to come, and the body is of Christ. He's saying... This all relates to us as his body and him living it through us. No longer us going, you know, the, the, what the law say? You, I'm talking to you, not him, not him in you. I'm talking to you. You do this, you'll be blessed. You don't do this, you'll be cursed. Okay? And that was, that was the basis of the law. It was all about you. And everybody failed. Can I get a oh me? Amen. So, but then he goes, you know what? That really wasn't all, what it was all about anyway. It wasn't about you keeping that. It was about those speaking to you of a higher thing where you would be the body of Christ. And he would live it through you. Somebody on Skype, help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's read on then, because this is good. Why not? <laughs> you know, yeah, let's just read the Bible. And if you're not enjoying the Bible, you got a problem, okay? <laughs> okay, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, in worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head. The head of what? The head of the church. No, the head of the body. Okay? Now I'm telling you that a body is really no good without a head. Okay? You know, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll embrace that. Mike, come on. You got to do something. Okay? And not holding the head from whom? Oh, my God. Do you see what this is saying? It's saying we're his body. You're not Christians. You're not doing Christian doctrine. You're not doing Christian behavior. You're not doing all this. You're his body. You're not alienated from the life of God. He's the head. And from him flows all that is supposed to happen. What? Well, you know, you'd be real happy if you were a mess like me. This is good news for people who aren't perfect like some of y'all. This is great because while you may be able to do it, there's some of us, man, we just fail, fail, fail. We need Jesus. We desperately need Jesus, and we want Jesus. And even if we didn't need Jesus, we want Jesus. Even if we could do it all, we would give it all up. Oh, I'm sorry, we're jumping to the third chapter of Philippians now. Uh-huh. Okay, well, let's read a little further because this is fun. And not holding the head from whom all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increased with the increase. What, what is it that increases? The increase of God. Okay. Now, you can just read that as doctrine. Or you can see the life of it. And if you see the life of it, oh my Lord, it'll change you from the inside out. You know, there's even more. Let's at least, at least read uh, a couple more verses here. Wherefore, if you be dead, what? Okay. 
One of the things you're going to find in Colossians and in many of the things is that it keeps, it, it's like this, these, this balances, these scales, and on one side is your union with Christ and resurrection, and on the other side is your death with Christ and the end of you, okay? And Christ is the new beginning in you, okay? Uh, resurrection, death, death, resurrection. Okay, so, here, so here's what he's saying. He's, he's talking about you're his body, but you're only his body in resurrection, okay? And it's important that you be dead for that to take place. You know, uh, the example I use a lot is if I had a cup of, of coffee and, I, and that coffee is me and it's bitter coffee and I go, oh, I want some Jesus, you know. You say, well, you know, you want me to just pour it in there? And Jesus is sweet tea. You know, and you go, yeah, that's that, me and Jesus. Some Christians drink that stuff. <laughs> They do, and they go, mm, this is good. I like me and Jesus got a good thing going, you know. You, would you like a drink? No, Paul would slap it out of their hands. <laughs> he says, empty that thing out, death. Empty it out. And let's pour in Christ. So both are true, but both must be maintained. Okay, listen to that now. You have to maintain, well, okay, let me give you one more example. It's over in the third chapter. In fact, it's not very far. Here it says, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, right? That's verse one. Verse three says, for you are dead. It didn't even, it didn't even wait past one verse. Okay, well, we're supposed to see something, something of reality in that. We're not supposed to just get confused and go, well, am I dead or risen? You're both. You are dead. In union with Christ, by his life, you're risen. Because to you, he is the resurrection. Thank you. I got it. <clears throat> he is the resurrection and the life. Okay, But that's only in resurrection. As long as you're alive, there is no resurrection. Because you're not dead. Because the one thing required for resurrection is death. Okay, so let's spell it out a little more clear. The one thing that's required for Christ to really live in you is you to be dead. Okay? Okay. Both of those must be maintained. There has to be a balance in you. It's not one or the other. It's not, it's not, it is this, it's like a constant reality that you know what? I died with Christ. And I'm risen with Christ. But you have to understand what that means. Most people, let me, let me do this. Most people, here's, here's the deal. It's like they're right here, okay? And they go, okay, um, uh, I died with Christ. So, you know, boom, you, you're struck by lightning. I guess we should do it a little more. Okay, so he's dead. And then I, I lay him down, but chalk is a little harder to do right here. So, but all of a sudden, because of Jesus, it's like Jesus comes along, and now you're up again. You're raised. So you were dead, but now you're alive. No, you are death, and he is life. Okay? So, so you can do it like this. Let me... Let me draw another one of these over here. And I guess, I guess I, since this might be different, I'm going to make him as big as the other guy over here. Okay, this guy. Okay. So here we are, and we go, oh, I want to come to Jesus, and I want to, you know, I want to be a Christian, and I want to do God things, and I want to be blessed, and I want to bless other people. He says, okay, well, here's, here's come unto me right here. And then you die, and then I will live, but I'll live in you. For you are dead. If you be risen with Christ, you see, do you see that balance? 
There's a genuine balance that has to be maintained. And you need the Holy Spirit to help you maintain that or you'll get confused. You'll get off. You'll, you'll get off on one. You'll start saying, oh, yeah, I'm just risen with Christ now and that's it. And the death is behind. The death is never behind. The proof of that is Jesus on the cross. He's still a lamb. I mean, come on. I don't, I don't want to get off on a bunch of other stuff that I, I'm personally into, but... Why in the world would Jesus die and then rise from the dead and be a, and the, the original Greek there is, a lamb as though it had been slaughtered, sitting on the throne. Scars and, I mean, a lamb as though it had been slaughtered, come on. You know, I mean, I don't know what that looks like because I wasn't there in, in the days of Israel killing lambs and, you know, all this stuff, you know. We're, we're thinking Jesus is sitting up there with sandals and, you know, white robe and a beard and everything. We're, oh, Jesus. You know, it can, it's going to be this slaughtered lamb. That's what it says. And he's, he's not ashamed of that. If that was us, oh, baby, it'd be a different story. We'd be sitting on that throne and we would be decked out. I'm risen. And I'm in a big free oh, and we have gold dripping off of us and worship me, they kill me, but I rose from the dead. Oh, that sounds like a televangelist, sorry. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, but that's what we're looking for. That's what we're thinking about. And he is unashamed Amen. of death because it is the thing that wrought the whole thing. The cross was the greatest thing that ever happened. God knows it, and the Son knows it, and the Holy Spirit, and they're not ashamed of it at all. They're not. They display it before the, everybody that's saved, you know. And they worshiped the lamb that was slaughtered. That's, what it, that's the wording. It didn't say they worshiped the guy that got up. Those are, folks, those are just mind change. I mean, they, it requires the Holy Spirit to bring in the true reality of the heart of God to see these things as God shows them to us. Because if we don't, then they're just somebody else's teaching. There's somebody else talking. All right. So um, <clears throat> we were contrasting the doctrine of Christ with Christ. Okay. There is no power in the theology of Christ. There's only power in Christ. You have to remember that. You have to remember that. No amount of, of theology of these things, you can talk about Paul's, they can perceive that Paul's talking about it here in Colossians, excuse me, the, the second chapter, but he's not. He is trying to communicate the living reality as we should know it as the church, the body of Christ. And we sit there and we listen to it as a teaching, living 2,000 years from that time and in, a, in a different room, and we go, well, praise God, that's some good stuff, you know. I, I even felt a little joy for a moment. <laughs> wow, you're, <laughs> you're really doing good. <clears throat> You're a champagne bottle that barely got opened. <clears throat> this, is, this, is, this is God's reality. This is not theology. This is not just talk. This is not just doctrine. We're, we're running out of time, and I don't know if I want to get into this next section. Uh, and, and then have to stop. <clears throat> so I'll just, I'll just say... Uh, in closing for this part, man, there, there's some beautiful stuff about Jesus in this word. And you know and I know, may, maybe there's somebody here or on Skype or whatever, maybe there's some of you that, that have read this scripture in Colossians, but tonight maybe while we were reading it, you just went, wow, that's really good. Not that you hadn't seen it before, but you hadn't seen it in a long time. Or maybe you haven't really seen it like that. And you just kind of went, man, this is 
good stuff. Thank God, you know. Well, that's proof that we can get lackadaisical in our ways, and we just get, we just, we just get dull, and we're not. The the passion is gone, and the desire for Jesus is is there. But usually, the way some of our people tend to show that is, well, we just start reading the Bible a lot. But it's, it's more than that, isn't it? I mean, really, I mean, it's gotta be more. Jesus said the words I speak are spirit and life. They're not ink and white paper. The words I speak are ink and white paper to you the way you're reading it. You know what I'm saying? The way you're reading it. But he's going, but really they're spirit and life. And I want you to be one with me in my reality and I want you to leave your mind and put on my mind. Because he said that. Let this mind be in you. He didn't say let my thoughts be in you. He didn't say let my brain be in you. It is this mindset. It is this selfless way of Christ. It is the way of the Lamb. It is the spirit of the family. The spirit of the family of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is. It's who they are. And, and we can, and I'm, I'm trying to quit here, but we can misread this stuff. We can misread it based on our fears and our selfishness and our pride and our, you know, a few other things. Anybody can think of something, you know? We can misread this and go, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to know about death. I want to know about life. I want to live. <laughs> hey, I've heard it before, okay? <laughs> well, folks, that's fine. That's fine. But what I'm asking you to do is instead of rebelling with your fears and everything like that, dial it down a couple of notches and just say, Holy Spirit, if there could be any truth to this, whether you show it to me this week or 10 years from now when I'm in a better place to hear it, please do so. I put it in your hands. I promise not to rebel and tear up the church and divide the thing and cause everybody to, you know, split and go in different directions. Is that, is that good? <laughs> we're not, I don't think we're in danger of that, but nonetheless, it's, it's still a good idea. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed. We'll come back in a few minutes.